Now, we've been talking so far about truth, about perceptions of how we see, what we believe, about intrinsic versus non-intrinsic good. I want to say one thing. We talked about ethics. Now, a lot of times you hear about ethics and morality. Now, again, ethics is a study of good and bad, right and wrong. It's the ought, what we should do, based on theories. We're going to talk about theories, where morality is actually the act of doing. I was driving one day, and I heard over the radio a perfect example to, to separate. Ethics would be about knowing that it's wrong to cheat on your spouse. Morality would be not doing it. So as we look at the two, also you'll see many times they're interchangeable in the sense people use them, but they're actually two complete different terms. I want to talk about some theories right now, because as you get to work on there are, there are uh, scenarios, you're going to need to use these theories. You need to understand them because you're going to explain the, what would be the correct answer using the different theories. The first one we're going to talk about is deontological. Famous is Kant. That's Kant's theory. And it talks about if it's right, it's right. And it's setting standards. And really it talks about uh, that ethics is that judges the right and wrongness of an act based on the act itself. Doesn't matter the consequences. This is a key concept. It's about, as a sworn officer or a person so, you know, within criminal justice, you have duties and responsibility. You took an oath that you will do certain things, that you will treat people fairly and justly, that you will see, you know, that due process. You, and this is part of what it is. Now, what Khan is saying, how can I judge you on what you're trying to do? I really can only judge you on what you do. That's what you should be judged on. For example, lying. Lying is wrong. Now, we may do it and we may justify it, but the act of lying itself is wrong. So what Kant would say. So we should base it on the act. And in fact, if it's right, Kant would say, that we, we'll talk about something called the categorical imperative. If it's right, it's right in all similar circumstances. I'm going to give you a scenario now, a true case. When I was working as an agent, uh, we had an incident down in uh, Cannon Falls. Uh, a young child, five-year-old, disappears. We believe she's dead. The investigation starts. It's a long-term investigation. I was involved in the investigation and brought in. My job actually was to work with the mother uh, of the missing child. And the FBI, my partner at the time, was working with the boyfriend. It was, so the case went on and on, and, and the case, as anything, as you started off with, uh, first one or two people, then a big task force, and then it, the task force kind of winged off over time with a lack of leads. And a group got together, and they decided they were going to bring in the boyfriend. This is all true. I actually had the video of the interview. And they brought him in, and they decided, as a group, that they, you know, including uh, people at all levels in the organization, that they were going to bring him in and they were going to get him to tell where the body is. That the goal was, is to bring little Jessica home. So they bring him in. FBI is doing the interview. In the interview, he asked for an attorney or asked to leave over 20 times. And finally, he said that it was an accident, she fell off the refrigerator, they put her to bed, the morning they found her, she was dead. They panicked, they rolled her up in a sheet, they took her out and, and hit her in the woods. He showed them where the body was. The issue is, Kant would say, this is wrong. And I'm gonna give you two theories, then we're gonna look at the theories and apply them to this. It doesn't matter what you're trying to accomplish. So let's look at the next theory, then we'll come back to the story. Kant's about your duty. Theological and under, think of theological as more of a very broad. And under, we're going to look at uh, utilitarianism is what we're going to look at the main theory. And this is really about the consequences of what we're trying to do. The greatest good for the greatest number of good people. Benefit. What is the greatest good versus the greatest pain? Ethics is that determines the uh, moral worth of an act based on the consequences or your intentions. And the main theory we talk about is really utilitarianism, and it's about the consequences. So let's take the story and build on it. The goal was, is to find her and bring her home. Now, I've had people argue with me, said this was a good thing, that we found her, we brought her home. 
Well, the trouble is, do you really, as Kant would argue, do you really know what the consequences? What if I found her and she'd been sexually abused? What if she'd been stabbed multi times? Because you never know what you're going to find. And if we feel good about this, and underneath Kant, if this is something good that we believe in, then we should teach this at all of our academies that if you're in doubt, just go ahead and violate the due process, violate people's rights, because your intentions were good. This was cl more clear towards that of a vigilante, people doing what they believe is right, versus a person who's sworn and has duties and responsibility, as we talked about with deontological. So it becomes a real challenge when you look at it. Now, these are two theories. And as we look at many times, if we look within your job, uh, the due process, protecting people's right is deontological. Sometimes protecting society becomes almost a theological. In fact, theological was actually, and utilitarianism was actually the foundation of our penal system. Before that, depending who you were, depending what money you had, is you're treated differently. And they're saying greatest good, greatest number of people. We're gonna look at an ethical dilemma later on, and we're gonna apply these theories. Now, these are theories and these are models. And the next one we're going to talk about is the theory of virtue theory or character. Now, I want you not to think about this as a model. This is more about you, the per ethical person. You know, it's, so we really need to start with you. What is you believe in? What is right? And then that is a person that's going to apply the models. Moral character, personal qualities and character traits. Habitual. Now, it's not something you're born with. It's something you learn. Now, a lot of people say you learn it when you grow up. You do on everything, good and bad, as you become a person and a young adult into becoming an adult. But it's not something that ends. You continually learn and you continually develop. So we can create moral people. You know, as, and again, yet, you could go to an agency that has high standards, that holds people accountable, that you know where you stand and people can become very, very morally correct. You can also have the opposite, where people have low standards in agency and they can do what they want and there's no ramification and there's a higher probability that there's gonna be unethical behavior. Now, again, it's about people, so I'm not trying to put everybody in the same box, but it is something you develop and continue to develop and the more you practice it, the better you become a moral person. It's natural and it's acquired. You know, so example, lying is dishonest. It's a vice, not a virtue. You know, back to lying. Virtue is the concept of happiness, is what we look at with virtue theory. It's, and we're talking about something called the golden mean. This is Aristotle really follows this, and we'll talk about when he looked at values and virtues. And a lot of the theories we apply today, if you go back in time, they're, they're older theories that we've able to reconstruct or change the, the, the direction of it a little, but they're based on Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and a lot of the other key, we'll call ethicists in the years past. Again, we're talking about character is the key. Character. So what is character? Does it really matter? I, I know of a case where they were hiring somebody high in an organization, and it was an IT position, and it was a supervisor of this organization, and they said, we really don't care what their strengths in IT. We're looking for somebody of high character because it's harder to train somebody of high character, it's easy to train or get help for IT because they'll report to her. So character does matter. Many of the, of the tests and the, and the uh, psych are based on character today far more, on scenarios. A lot of people, you go for a job and a lot of the scenarios are based on character, moral character, ethical values, you know, not how much you know the law. So that is, does matter. And again, if you look at the data and the people who lost their jobs and, and even worse, it's based on the lack of character. So, so what are some of the attributes of a person of high moral character, of good character? The honesty, the trust, the integrity. And again, I'm not saying we're perfect because in life we think about a line, we, you know, we drop below the line sometimes, we make mistakes. But and again, your job is going to help bring people above the line and for you to help it stay above the line but it's hard when we don't have standards. 
Character is something you develop. You know, it really is not something you're just born with. It, it's something we develop by practicing and practicing good character. And again, ethics is about the courage, the character and courage and how we meet the challenges when doing the right thing will cost us more than we want to pay. Again, it's the ought. S simple scenario. I was teaching a class and I was out in it was Minnesota and out in a rural area, in a pretty big department out there, a sheriff and the police. And they brought me in to do a class on ethics. And in the class, I use a scenario. You're driving down the road, you know, and you pull somebody over and it's a police officer. You hear this scenario all the time. And, but everybody started chuckling and laughing. And I said, what's going on? What's the issue here? And they said, and they looked at this and pointed at the sergeant. And I said, what happened? Well, one of his officers pulled him over for speeding and gave him a ticket. And everybody started laughing. And then they said, and she'll get hers which is an interesting statement. She wasn't in the room, but in the room was a deputy chief who didn't disagree. Now here's the issue. If she gave the ticket because she wanted everybody to think that she was a moral person or how tough she was, is that being an ethical? No. If she gave the ticket because it was the right thing to do in her mind, then she was doing the right thing. The question is, what will she pay for it? I have no problem on her decision to give a ticket or not give a ticket. I have a huge problem on the person that was speeding that expects not to get the ticket, that believe they have a right, that their entitlement to do whatever they want. And they put that person in that position. And that's what's about ethics. Because how people say, you know, I don't care if you give a ticket. I care why you don't give the ticket and I have a big problem with the person who truly has an expectation that the law doesn't apply and they don't even care enough about you that they would put you in that position in the first place. Sometimes you do. You're not perfect. Sometimes you're going to make a decision. My goal is you at least understand the consequences of what you did and why it's unethical. But sometimes it will cost you more. Plato talked about, you know, uh, this balance, you know, but the reality, the golden mean. And he said, when you look at all many, not the intrinsic, but most of the non-intrinsic values, they're on, a, they're on a continuum. Like courage, he used the example. There's a difference between the right amount and too much, being a coward or being foolhardy or balance. And loyalty is one of the key things we're going to talk about. There's a difference on loyalty. Loyalty isn't just stagnant. Being disloyal is, is, is an awful term. Nobody wants to be referred to as disloyal. But blind loyalty is also as bad. To follow because I have to. I got to be loyal to anybody in a uniform of what you do. I got to be loyal to whoever commits crime or my supervisor because he's my supervisor. Loyalty, as we talked about before, is an intrinsic, non intrinsic value and only a value in reference to why you're loyal. So a lot of the non intrinsic values is. is uh, Aristotle would talk about, I want you to picture on a continuum and where it fits. And our goal is to find that middle ground between the extremes when we talk about why the, the principles behind these values. Justice. Uh, John Rawls talks about, and it's a really important concept, social justice. And this is really helps understand that why certain groups are getting certain benefits. Because his idea was, Everybody should be treated fairly, social justice. And if they're not treated the same, everybody should be treated the same, we have to be able to justify why we don't treat them the same. You know, so it is not unjust if, benefit, if it benefits all. A lot of times you hear about why you know, certain groups get special benefits or treated differently. Well, his point is, if, there's, if the disenfranchise, those that have the least, it benefits us all to help them come up to the same level as others. And so when we, in the same situation, we will give certain more benefits to those that, don't, that have less. And that's the principle of social justice. I hear people talking about affirmative action. That's what affirmative action is about. When we look at our history, and we say over time certain groups have not had a fair opportunity, then social justice is to help those groups come up to a level with the understanding once we get there, then it would not be fair to continue. You know, but we're not there. And so that's part. And, so, and it, in it, some of the theories, so it betters the least 
uh, advantage. Now, he talks about, which is a really important concept, under the veil of ignorance. If it's right, it's right no matter who you are. So I want you to picture. Somebody says, well, uh, racial profiling. We're going to pull somebody over because we know this fact. We know that certain numbers are certain races. Well, John Rawls would say, well, it shouldn't matter. Then what you do should be fair to everybody, and you shouldn't know what their race is, what their gender, and how you treat them should make no difference at all. And would you want to be treated or your wife or your children be treated in the same way under those same circumstances? If not, it's wrong. Back to our story uh, from before on the uh, interview. If it was right to do what they did, then we should say it should be right in all circumstances, not because of the individual was a, from a, in trouble. He wasn't a bad person, but he, you know, there was bar fights and too much drinking. That this should be okay no matter who you are. If it's your wife, it's your child, it's a neighbor. If we don't like where we're going, we can violate your rights. And I don't think anybody would accept that. So these become the key. Now I want to talk about some key concepts of authority and discretion too. All right, what is authority? Where do the police get their authority? Where do you get your authority? So as you apply this force you can use it within criminal justice, where does it come from? It's not naked course of power to do whatever you want. Authority is loaned to you, to give to you, as long as you don't violate it. You know, it's not when you become a police officer and you are a police officer, you're giving certain powers and rights. That's it, loaned to you as long as you work within the parameters of what an officer is. Authority is not the right, it's loaned to you. It's not something you own. And I'm going to talk about a couple key concepts, and I'll do them in a second, and it's called with Hobbs and Locks on the Social Contract. And we're going to use the story I just talked about, the scenario. A lot of this training in this program, a lot of the in here is going to be based on scenarios as you work through them. So let's look, what is a social contract? First we start with Hobbes. Hobbes is a, you know, a philosopher back to oh, the time of Charles I, and at that time we had a, uh, England revolted and charged, I believe he was, he was beheaded, and Parliament took over. So what gives Parliament the right to dictate what is the law? Because see, before that, you know, the King of England was basically divine right of God. And now, what give, so what gives Parliament the right? Well, Hobbes said the right is that of the social contract. And he uses an example, which we'll have some verbiage in a minute. But the example of the social contract is, I want you to picture you live in a society with no raw laws, no rules. It's harmony, right? We all work together, we share things. In reality, it's not. Those with the greatest strength take away for those that have the least. So what do we do as people? If he's bigger than me, he can take whatever he wants. So we join together. Now there's two of us. Well, maybe we're the ones violating the rights. So society then joins together in a community. And in this community, they share the power in this community. But, the, but it's a contract. So what I do in the social contract is I am willing to give up my right to to devil injustice or to, uh, to punish, to do whatever I need. And I give it to you as society. And for that, I get certain things. That's a contract. I want you to think about it like a contract. It's not a real one. It's a tack. It's an implied contract. You live in this society. You abide by it. I get, you guarantee me due process. You guarantee me equal access. You guarantee me justice. And for that, I give you the power as the government and the law enforcement to have the power to carry out certain things as long as you don't abuse them. That concept is key to, a, to law enforcement or our government itself in the power over other people to dictate their lives. The social contact. People have given up liberty in return for societal protection. Soci guaranteed protection. TAC, not real. The concept is if you live in the community, you accept it for every individual, not just those you like. The individual in the story I told you, they, did, they believed he's guilty of this crime. And in fact, the worst part of the scenario, if somebody else tried to do that to him, they were obligated to protect him 
from somebody abusing his rights, not abusing his rights. So it doesn't matter. And it's a difficult job, Bessie Law Enforcement. If in fact that bothers you, then maybe this is not a field you should be in. You, even people you dislike, you have to protect. That's part of that contract. That's part of living in a community. And sometimes we have conflict, as we talk about. Now, the next part I want to talk about here is, now you're going to use the social contract and explain some of what you did in those scenarios, which is part, going to be actually towards your final exam, and you're going to have to explain it. Now, with it, I want to set certain values or certain, we're going to call the five standards. And these five standards is what you're now going to apply with in mind the social contract. Now, a lot of this here comes from a book called Power and Restraint. Uh, they have a great, they have scenarios built in it. And we're going to use those five standards they use as we go through. Okay, uh, here's the standards and then I'll talk about them individually and break them down. They are uh, fair access to service, Law enforcement is a public trust, safety and security for, of all citizens, teamwork and objectivity. The, now you're going to, part of again, the assignment you're going to have throughout this program is that well, you're going to look at a scenario and you're going to say which one of these standards apply. So let's look what they are. Fair access as a, uh, of a society, resources. Government and public agencies must provide fair access to their services. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It's the service. So you may pay a lot more tax and live in a really rich area and demand more police service, and yet we may have an area that they pay almost no tax that's a high crime area and the police are needed. It's, so the greatest need, not based on money, not based on who you know, should be for need, not on economic status. This is what we're saying. Everybody has a right to the police, fair access. It doesn't mean equal. Maybe you hire somebody on the side that does more work. But there's a certain level, everybody. Now, some of you, I'm going to help you relate to this by using, I want you to picture in the workplace how you're treated. So we're going to use it. How do you feel when you are, are limited within your agency through favoritism? How do you feel when you don't have the same in an organization? You work, maybe you're working in law enforcement and other people get favoritism and you don't get the opportunities. It's the same thing. People in your community have a right to be treated fairly. That's the first standard. Okay, this is standard one. Standard two is public trust. Now, as an officer of the law or correction, probation, or even nonprofits, with the power given to you, there's a public trust that goes along with it. We trust you to do the right thing. Nobody's watching you half the time, or even more than that. So we expect you not to take the money. We expect you not to take the drugs. We expect when you tell the truth, you are telling the truth. So citizens are given limited power to enforce their own rights and have made government and the work of the public agency of public trust. This is significant when we look at ethical dilemmas and, and, and ethical misconduct. Did they violate the public trust? But let's go and use the same scenario, maybe closer to some of you in the workplace. How do you feel when people violate your trust? How do you feel in an organization when it doesn't matter where they don't tell the truth or they give, again, back to even favoritisms? You know, how do you feel when your supervisor has a public trust and a duty to you and fails to do it? It's, again, all about power. So I want to relate something that for some of you who don't have the experience, you can think about it in a workplace. How do people with the power treat you? These are probably two of the most key ones. But let's move ahead to the next one, safety and security. Part of that is you have a responsibility, an overriding responsibility to keep people safe. And so let's take a look at, and I'll give you a scenario. Government and public agencies must uh, undertake their responsibility within the framework of maintaining safety and security. Scenario, in fact, this is from the power and restraint. You're working at a concert, and at the concert, it's outdoors, you notice some bikers, some gang members, and they're selling drugs right in the conference. Now, you know from your experience they're normally armed and dangerous. I know you can go and arrest them, but would it be the right thing? Could it create an environment that's far more dangerous than what you're trying to accomplish? Because your overriding duty is to keep people safe and secure. And so that should be, so we take a look at 
You know, it's really the part of the responsibility in the work environment. Uh, sexual harassment, uh, a lot of things. Do people feel safe? But let me give you another story. I was at a conference one day and a sheriff was talking and it's from a big, like Tennessee, uh, fairly large department. And he said, you know, I always told the guys in my department, somebody runs from you, you chase them. You don't let them get away because they run, they keep running, and it makes it worse. You chase them down no matter what. Well, he said, one day my deputies were chasing, and they're on a rural area along, which is kind of winding roads along in a mountain area. And as they chased the person, he went across the line, and he hit head on and killed the whole family. And the sheriff paused, and he said, that was my family. He said, they killed my whole family. So was it really worth it to chase this person? And the person didn't commit a big crime. So sometimes backing off because what the consequences are far greater and what we're creating is far worse than what we're doing. So just winning alone is not enough. The difference between effectiveness and efficiency. There's more to the job than just be getting the job done. You have to balance what is the best for the people and the danger is. And again, that whole thing as we talked about, an example. And the next one, let's say teamwork. Law enforcement is standing alone. Teamwork is far greater than that. Let's take a look here. The government and the public agency are part of a system, including the legislature and other departments and agencies and prosecutors and judge. So their behavior must meet the test of teamwork, cooperation, communication, you know. Uh, so let's give you an example. This would be where we say, my job in law enforcement, for example, and correction, is never to punish. I have no right ever to punish somebody. Don't be confused. I can use a lot of force, but I cannot punish you. The job to punish you is really with the court. The job to carry out the punishment is with corrections. Now, I can use I, unbelievable force, including taking your life, as long as it's within the parameters of completing a legitimate goal. But I don't have a right to punish you. Teamwork is working together, and we all have duties and responsibilities within the, not just that. So think about the importance, the opportunity important to you. Teamwork is critical. And then the last of the five standards we're working our way through is objectivity. This is about you and deal with prejudice, deal with biases, everything, and how, in fact, you need to treat people on their behavior and treat them fairly. Uh, this is the equality. This is, you know, requires law enforcement officers to set personal feelings aside and biases in performing their duty and partiality. The problem is everybody has a degree of prejudice. And a lot of time, take us back to the first part, it's based on conjecture. It's based on imagination. It's based on beliefs that have no, they're not substantial. Maybe there's a piece of the truth, but you can't then from there come to, you know, that it's a complete truth. Objectivity, how we treat people, how we treat them fairly, how we treat them. These are the five standards. So when you'll be working on your scenarios, you're going to have to apply, take and look at the, you can't put them all. You're going to have to say which one of these apply and how does that affect the social contract and be able to explain it.